Hey, welcome to our program. Let's just begin with a word of prayer. Pastor Ash. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we are living in a world in which things are changing so rapidly. And so, Father, today we believe in your word. We believe that you are the God that changes not. And uh, so help us to understand about your character and help us also to understand how to navigate in this uh, fast-changing climate. Uh, guide in our discussion today and please uh, direct our minds and our hearts closer to the kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let me introduce our uh, who all is here today. Uh, that's Pastor Ash. He's the pastor of the State Line Church in Oregon. Actually, I should say in Oregon and Washington because it's truly well named, the State Line Church. Um, we have Wayne Blakely and Ron Woolsey here uh, to share with us, and they have ministries. When we're done, we'll, we'll uh, remind you of all their links, and uh, they've kind of come out of the LGBT um, circle. Uh, we have uh, Pastor Ash and myself are pastors. I'm a pastor in Michigan, Larry Kirkpatrick, and, um, and then we have uh, Jerry Wagner, who is operates, he's a layperson, he runs the fulcrum7.com website and ministry, and we have Jonathan Zirkel, who is uh, a, a lawyer and focus on religious liberty and things like that, and we're glad to have uh, Brother, Brother Zirkel with us. Uh, right now, this week, we have the Respect for Marriage Act, and it seems to be connected with the Equality Act or the Fairness for All Act, and uh, so what we want to do here is just sort of begin by understanding what this is that we're talking about. And so I don't know, um, Wayne, could you tell us in kind of a succinct way, uh, what is this Respect for Marriage Act that is uh, imminent apparently to be possibly passed in the United States Congress? Sure. Can I uh, go over a brief description of each of the terms? Certainly. Okay, so the Equality Act has looked to eliminate any kind of discrimination of a person identifying as LGBTQ. This, in turn, begins to erode our religious freedom, given the contrasting beliefs of LGBTQ-identified people um, versus the teachings of the Bible. So that includes housing, employment, schooling, locker rooms, adoption, fitness centers, churches, and so on. Until now government, including Barack Obama, have insisted that religious freedom is a universal human right. <clears throat> Currently under private denominations, um, we have what is called in a legal term, ministerial exception. And so that means that we can uphold biblical standards. Um, the LGBT community is fighting this and has come to, in some cases, into the court system challenging ministerial exception. Adventists have this right, but really don't use it, mainly because they aren't teaching biblical principles or providing sexual purity education or seminars. This has opened the door for students pushing the limits and challenging governing ad administration leaders. The Fairness for All Act is um, respects a person's right to be LGBT, yet still keeps some of the ministerial exceptions in place. There are some slight variances under the Fairness for All Act that include, or I'm sorry, that continue to make some minor provisions for religious exceptions. <clears throat> it's kind of like uh, pleading or begging to keep just a little bit of religious freedom intact. The Fairness for All Act is more politically correct version of the Equality Act. It allows government to keep its fingers in religion. Basically, it's a coexistence between the two belief systems, giving incremental involvement of the government in religion. Given the legal introduction of gay marriage in 2015, it aids in the process of disintegrating the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which has been in place. There's a give and take about what religious entity can and can't do on the basis of sexual identity and sexual orientation. It protects some businesses <clears throat> under religious liberties ministerial exception to general discrimination law. One article says it's a master class in death by a thousand cuts. The Fairness for All Act leaves individual objectors with no recourse. The message to private religious citizens, educators, medical professionals, scholastic athletes, 
or wedding service providers is clear, submit or else your religion will be hanged. In the Respect for Marriage Act, what has, which has just come about, came about from the standpoint of um, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas making a comment um, after the Roe versus Wade was overturned. And he said, hmm, you know, there are um, 32 states with same-sex marriage bans still on the books. Maybe we could overturn that as well. And that is what began the scuffle um, to come about um, overriding this and making it very clear to the United States that whatever happens in one state will be honored by another state. This turns around and overrides the Defense of Marriage Act of 1996 that basically says that one state need not honor what legally took place in another state. And so here we are. Hard to compress that into a, a small space. And I think you've probably done as well as any of us could. Uh, so right now, uh, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, which I think we all are part of, um, has the lawyers in the church have come and tried to help with the um, Respect for Marriage Act to put in some protections, they say, to help with religious liberty, uh, to maintain more of that. Uh, they say that they're not really endorsing the Respect for Marriage Act, but they're trying to make it better, uh, give us some sustaining of freedoms that otherwise wouldn't be in there. So that's kind of where we are, and so that's kind of provoked us to think together and have this discussion uh, where we're going to try to plow into this and get a better understanding of it. How do our thoughts and ideas about marriage help us or hinder us toward heaven? Why does this even matter? Why don't we just let them make all the laws in D.C. and we just kind of sit back? Who has a thought to share on that? You know, as as Christians— I think we we would agree that we should not be involved in legislating morality. And that's how the Sunday law will come about the in the end, legislating morality. And we we don't believe in doing that because God is love. He's not, he doesn't want forced worship. But on the other hand, when it comes to immorality, I think that we should take a clear stand against legislating immorality. We should not be supportive of legislation that promotes and protects immorality. And that's not being involved in legislating. It's opposing the legislation of, uh, of immorality. You think about in past cultures, you know, the normalization of, of the, the gay issue, homosexuality, kind of signaled the demise of that culture. I think where, where we're concerned... If we are, if we have an opportunity to speak against legislation that that promotes, legalizes, promotes, celebrates, and glorifies uh, immorality, we should we should speak against it. You know, yeah, I'd like to, to say one thing about that. You know, if you look at all laws, all the classic laws the governments are supposed to be involved in, like. Um, you know the basic ones for against theft, against murder, against violence, and and things like that. These really are moral questions. Killing someone is a moral question. So I don't think if you spend too much time thinking about the idea of legislating for or against morality, I think you'll find that all laws have a moral component. At least all the good ones that are in the the classic the classic area. I think one of the problems that this uh, situation addresses is that. Um, as Christians, we look to the Bible for our lead on, on marriage and where it should be. But, um, you know, traditionally, governments have looked at this um, throughout history. And if you go back and look at Plato, for instance, he talked about the family and how that was important to, to society. Now, we may not agree with what he had to say about it, but um, I do think that we need to clarify our thinking a little better and, and I think that this is a real struggle as to where it's appropriate for us to talk about legislating in this area. And I, I think in this area that it, that it is appropriate for the government to legislate in, but just like legislating in the areas of theft or murder, the government has to really take the right position. It can't take the wrong position. Well, and I agree that we should, we should support legislation that protects morality, uh, but what I'm talking about is legislating 
forcing immorality upon society. Um, I don't know that that we should take any part in supporting such a bill. Uh, I agree. Yeah, I what agree. I mean, the very uh, the very example that you're giving, we would not support a bill that promotes um, murder or theft or uh, you know we want to protect society from immorality, but we should not promote bills that promote immorality. You know, yeah. and I would, I would just jump in right here with Ron Woolsey, because I, I think what, what we see is the activist side, the LGBTQ community coming and they're, they're taking these pieces of legislation and they're weaponizing them against conservatives. And that's, that's where it really, in, in my opinion, where it really comes down is that, uh, and why conservatives are so concerned, is that it's not that we're against you know, people, uh, it's, it's just that we, we know that when these things get passed, that immediately it's going to be turned as a cudgel to, uh, to, to hit, you know, and, and to try to bring force society into their box. And that, that's, that's a problem. So as I understand it, this uh, means that if this is passed, uh, finally through the, and made a, made a, a law, signed into law, uh, this uh, Respect for Marriage Act, kind of Orwellianly named, but it, uh, it will basically require all states to, res to um, recognize uh, a marriage, like if a marriage is conducted in Connecticut or New Hampshire or California, maybe, maybe people in Alabama or Florida wouldn't agree uh, with the, that that union is an actual marriage but this, uh, this is passed. This would require them to uh, all the states to recognize that as a as a morally binding, or at least as a civilly binding marriage. So this this sort of takes away uh, state things that might be left to the states, and it federalizes it. If if I'm understanding it right. Have you noticed how rapidly things are changing lately, mm -hmm. friends? I know you have. A huge moral shifts that used to take almost a century are now happening in a space of seven to 10 years. For instance, in the last decade, in a period of about seven years, a majority of American people went to believing that same-sex marriage should not be legalized to a majority believing that same-sex marriage must be legalized, uh, 2011 to the fall of 2018. So along with this moral tide of lawlessness, we ask ourselves, where is it coming from? We say, well, it's coming from culture. True, but culture is not neutral, friends. Culture we live in is not neutral. It comes from somewhere. Acceptance, like James mentioned, is ultimately demanded of these things. No other viewpoint is allowed. In fact, you've noticed recently that there's very little debate allowed on the issue of LGBTQ or being silenced. And it's a deliberate rationalization of something that God does not accept. It's also animated by a lively sense of self-righteousness and moral outrage. Any dissent is titled hate speech, since the necessity of self-justification requires the complicity of the whole culture. Holdouts cannot be tolerated because they are potential rebukes. So this is a neo-pagan religion that we're seeing. Our culture is not secular anymore. It used to be for about 200 years. It hit the high point of secularism, but now we're moving into a neo-pagan culture. And the homosexuality tidal wave is simply a sacrament of that new religion. Well, I think that we began as, uh, well, the Declaration of Independence he said, we, we hold these truths to be self-evident, right? That we are endowed by our creator with certain rights. So the foundation of America is, uh, is theistic. It's a theistic ethical framework. We have certain, uh, certain things that are ours. Every person has certain things because they're made in God's image. We all have a certain human dignity. And then we seem like today there's a movement to a non-theistic um, kind of ethical framework. 
we expect to keep people expect to expand on their rights uh and yet uh we're doing it without a foundation like if we're not made in god's if we're just come because of darwinian evolution or some form of evolution then where do we really get our rights it's just a group of animals uh we're just the apex predators you know who are deciding uh what we're going to decide what morality is so it seems like we're moving very rapidly from a christian framework uh a theistic framework to a non-theistic framework and uh this we want to have dignity for each person but uh i don't know the way it seems like it's coming with a very forceful way and i just it seems as though maybe the church is way behind uh in our universities in our in our churches this is affecting every family there's just very rapid changes it seems as though the church needs to be more awake and alert i don't know maybe we are more awake and alert than i think but uh, do any of you think that yeah i do the adventist church has so many wonderful things to say to the world however there is one area in which we have not done well to date and that is understanding the culture that we're in understanding the times that we're in the bible says king david had a group of men around him who helped him understand the times that he was living in we need some of those people among us they were called the sons of issachar in the bible by the way you know just a few decades ago uh, i remember the the gay community just wanted to be tolerated their big push was just to be left alone to be tolerated because they felt persecuted and once they achieved that level of toleration then they wanted to be accepted and then gradually the mood of the country and society shifted to where they were accepted and then it became legislated protections and then promotion and then celebration and now it's a glorification to where the the very community that so wanted to be tolerated just a few decades ago has become totally intolerant and i think what we're seeing with the church is similar to uh the issue with haman and mordecai uh, um, when haman was paraded through the city and on the, with the king's robes and everyone was bowing to him it was not enough that almost everyone was bowing to him one man refused to bow and that's all he could focus on was the one who would not and that's what i see happening today with this this issue that um they seem to uh feel that unless well unless everybody bows uh they they cannot be satisfied because those few that are not bowing and i think somewhat one of you touched on that already are a rebuke it's a rebuke um it, it reminds me of this saying you know once gay always gay how many people does it take to disprove that theory it only takes one and so there's so much animus towards anyone who professes to have left the gay culture um because anyone that leaves it and demonstrates a new life in christ and and blending in with uh normal religious society in accordance with god's plan is is a rebuke and they can't handle that they they want to silence any evidence that they might be wrong um and i i think that's probably one of the reasons that there's so much of an effort but then also in luke 17 jesus himself said that as it was in the days of noah and also as it was in the days of lot even though shall it be when the son of man shall be revealed and i really think this whole issue is a definite sign of the soon coming of jesus the whole world is turning into the type of culture of sodom and gomorrah and um and there is less and less toleration for any voice of reason or or dissent with that in fact it's it's viewed that that if you don't agree then that's rejection and rejection is hate and therefore you have the hate speech laws 
and the hate crime laws. And it's based really on a simple disagreement. The, uh, the culture seems to not be able to handle uh, any, any uh, disagreement with their point of view. Uh, and so they label it as hate. And that's why we're so divided. And this is coming into the church as well. We're seeing it more and more in the church. So America has been known, you know, around the world for its freedoms. That's why everybody wants to come here. But what's falling at the wayside now is a mutual respect, which is now destroying those freedoms. And, and what's being put in place by an LGBT narrative today is, is pretty much a Marxist move in, in moving to a socialistic government. Now, is it fair to think of uh, all LGBT people as a block? I mean, we're kind of talking about them like a block, and yet I think, I think that's probably, there's probably a range of viewpoints, including some very open people uh, that are not super militant. Is that... I would say so because because what we're hearing is really just from the from the activists and from the things that get pushed into law or show up on ballots. <clears throat> Whereas if we begin to have individual conversations with those identifying as LGBTQ, we would find a, a broader uh, paintbrush. I, I think you're right on that. Well, so and I like you... to point out. Uh, I like to point out in my presentations that not every every gay person is political. But they benefit from the politics, and not every gay person is an is an activist. But they benefit from the activism, and not every gay person is militant. But they end up benefiting from the militants. But you're right. I mean, it only takes you know the squeaky wheel, and the squeaky wheel I don't think is the vast majority of the gay community. But that squeaky wheel is very very active. Uh, and in promoting that agenda, and, it's got and a loud the whole gay community benefits from it. I think that so there's a large component too, um, Pastor Larry, uh, particularly on Christian university campuses and in our situation on Adventist university campuses. You know, I actually there's a pastor here who asked me one time. <laughs> Do you know anybody that's young that speaks to this? And and I said, what are you inferring by that? And we had a laugh. Because clearly, did, I'm, did you uh, refer I'm, them to me? <laughs> right, Ron. <laughs> and I said, but do you do you know why that is? We we can't even get onto our own university campuses today to help somebody who's identifying as LGBTQ to understand what it is. What's the other option? What it is? What what is Jesus asking? And so they immediately jump jump to a um, a hate you know, premise, whereas if we had more time to explain, you know, why would you give up um, your ideations and what you feel from a from a fleshly standpoint of view for for someone who who is your king, who is your creator, et cetera, we, we aren't having those kinds of conversations. Now, Pastor Ash, didn't you and, and uh, Brother Blakely here, you've recently had a meeting in your church, which is just two miles or, or maybe not even two miles from Walla Walla University. Uh, and I understand, I don't want to go back over old ground you've already covered, but um, I understand there was a mixed, there were different reactions, I guess you could say, uh, to what happened there. But a lot of young people actually did come to here, even though it wasn't right on the university. But there were some that came that were looked kind of unhappy. There was uh, a response. Um, someone from the community is a, is very much an activist and he put out the word uh to those who are of the same persuasion and they came they came and you know what we we had talked about this and we said look you know what let's just invite them inside that's these are the people that we want to we want to talk to we want to speak to their hearts and i was so glad you know wayne wayne um, wayne was there and uh kind of helped us through that process you know and and we did, some, uh, some of them came inside um, and they sat there uh, probably about four rows back on the left side. And uh, while we were praying, we had been praying the whole time that, uh, you know, that they would come inside, but uh, that they wouldn't be disruptive. And uh, praise the Lord, uh, they weren't disruptive. Uh, they, they were definitely making uh, kind of quiet comments to, you know, uh, at various times. But there were other times where we could see the spirit of God really um, just very present there. And so um, 
we plan to have more of these types of meetings and uh, we plan to keep inviting people because look, you know what? Every young person needs to hear the gospel of Jesus and every young people person needs to know that there is an answer that they can find freedom in Christ. And, uh, and I will, I, I'm, I'm not ashamed of that. You know, I think <laughs> pastor James, what was, what was so great about that weekend was that they didn't receive or see the hate that is part of their, their, um, you know, narrative and that anyone that disagrees with them hates them. And, and that certainly was not the case there at all. You know, they were invited to enjoy, to join us in a meal and to come to a question and answer in the afternoon to ask, you know, any questions that they wanted to ask. Um, there was one in particular that said, oh, good, I get to come and debate you. And I said, well, you know, nobody really, nobody wins in a debate. I mean, you're certainly welcome to, to come and ask a question and I'll give you the answer that I have just because I'm the speaker today, but it, it's not a, a forum to, to debate, one, debate one another. Jonathan, aren't you in the uh, Loma Melinda area? What's the, uh, I, I guess, I guess I would think that in that area, you might have uh, even more polarized uh, situation or more, more LGBT advocacy there. Um, is this, uh, is this topic, the, uh, the Respect for Marriage Act, something that you're hearing about there? Actually, I haven't heard it too much in the context of my local community. Um, I mainly just hear it from the folks that I have, a, I have a scattered network of friends that are in the religious liberty communities uh, around the country, and we've been chatting amongst ourselves. I do know that Loma Linda University is a very um, LGBTQ friendly place and goes to great lengths to try to make itself that way. Um, you know, th there's an observation that I'd like to make in all of this, and that is the, the Adventist church has traditionally held um, uh, that its members should be very active in the fight against prohibition. And uh, we've also been very active in fighting cigarettes in tobacco, we, we were very active in that in Congress and stuff like that. Uh, but then we come along, the climate that we seem to be in today is we get counseled that we're only supposed to be active on aspects that, do, that directly relate to worship. And um, then we're told that we should keep our mouths shut on, on uh, anything else. And I would just like to point out that that isn't the traditional position of the Adventist church. And um, I think that uh, Jerry points out a really good thing that we're in this culture war. And I think it's important for us to, to um, participate. And uh, if you look at this latest thing with this, um, uh, the defense of, excuse me, the uh, Respect for Marriage Act, um, our religious liberty departments are saying that, uh, that they're writing letters that basically, whether they, it's almost like they support the bill even just by their silence as far as not having anything negative to say about the bill. And that's just not, as, as Adventists, that's not our position. It's not the position of Christ church. Um, and if you look also in scripture, you know, uh, God got involved in other governments besides his own theocracy. Um, if you take an example of Jonah, uh, you know, goes to Nineveh and tries to set him straight. And, you know, you look at Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, these, these weren't his theocracy, but yet God had a point where he said no more. And we have a duty really to warn people. And it isn't just about worship issues. It isn't just about Sabbath. Um, it's about a whole host of issues. You know, God, God hasn't changed. Um, he's interested in all of these issues. And we need to speak up. Yeah, so often we hear people say, or at least I have. Well, that's that's not our battle. I know you've heard that, John. Or or they say that's not the hill to die on. Well, how do you know if someone's a good soldier? How do you know? You have to observe them. Observe them in battle. See how they do. And if we keep saying that's not our battle or that's not our hill to die on, pretty soon there's no hills left to die on. We've left them all go away, run over us. So at some point, we need to stand up like John the Baptist and, and say, this is wrong. This is opposed to the word of God. 
Uh, Paul tells us in 2 Timothy that some pretty ugly times are coming on the earth. And we need to stand together. We need to do it in love. We need to speak the truth in righteousness. We need to speak it kindly for sure. But we need to stand up for it. If we don't stand up for it, we'll never stand when the real test comes along, friend. See, courage is not something that we can go out and purchase in an emergency. It's a way of life. Go ahead. The, yeah, the, re, the Respect for Marriage Act is um, just reemphasizing that what happened in 2015 is for real and like it's not going to change. So when when this is reemphasized and put before the public eye and before Christians again, that you, you have lost the battle on the biblical definition of marriage, um, does this in turn go ahead and make it easier for the Equality Act to pass because it has not passed through the Senate. It's been presented three times. <clears throat> so it, well, I think we are seeing what's, what's about to come and that will be the Equality Act. And, and what does the Fairness Act do as it relates to that? I've seen some commentary <clears throat> by um, attorneys and by people um, connected with Adventism that have you know suggested that the fairness for all act is the route to go <clears throat> again it sounds like we're not standing up as jonathan mentioned for for biblical truth but we're willing to compromise and say well if you throw us a bone we'll take that but we don't seem to want to to you can't have the best of both worlds the beauty of holiness a lot of people probably don't even have the first understanding of what that is and but sexuality has been put on the top of the pile. Uh, everything is sexualized, politicized, sexualized. Uh, I wonder, as we're thinking about, you know, marriage and all this together, what what is the purpose of human sexuality? What is the purpose of marriage? Do you think that maybe some of our young people are being sold kind of a kind of a shiny, glowing? Uh, figment of imagination that that is sort of oversold that there are other things that are more that are that are satisfying uh holiness and self-control are pieces that aren't emphasized in our culture and yet these acts these these laws look like they're going to kind of punch it in that uh, uh we won the culture wars again you guys lost again and it sort of puts sexuality right up there at the top front front seat again uh, people who might be thinking, watching this, if I've never heard another perspective about sexuality, uh, what what is the design? What is human sexuality about? What is marriage about? What is a eunuch gift about? I don't know, just thinking maybe we ought to take a few minutes with that because I, I think we're we're getting something bright and shiny that maybe when we get it, we'll say, well, this isn't all that we thought it was. I think that's a great question. And I, I would start it off by saying what, what marriage isn't probably from a biblical standpoint. I think what's happened is that there's become kind of a hedonistic worldview where uh, marriage is viewed as something that is supposed to give me pleasure and supposed to make me happy. And because of that, we see people throw away marriages very quickly and very easily. And so you see this revolution in divorce um, and then if you take that kind of a viewpoint, kind of a hedonistic viewpoint, then the viewpoint is kind of like, well, what feels good, what makes me happy, that's what I'm supposed to be pursuing. And therefore, it's perfectly logical to pursue LGBTQ pursuits if that's what rocks your boat. But that that's what we're competing against. I think it, it, it's really good, and I, I leave it to the pastors to try to enunciate exactly what it is that marriage is supposed to be, but it has something to do with the building of the family and replicating the love of God and God's nature. The family unit really is the closest we can get to really understanding what the union of God was about. Because, you know, God is, uh, even in the word Elohim, it's a plural, and God is love, and love can only happen when there's more than one person to love. <laughs> and so this this idea that um, and, and this is I, I think where uh, Satan has been so effective at destroying trying to destroy the union of the family because this is the closest approximation that we can find here on this on this earth to understanding what God is like and and so you know 
this this destruction of the family unit. He he absolutely hates the family union, and so he's he's out to try to destroy the image of God. This is why you know carving up you know bodies, uh, you know, and and stuff, and and then trying to destroy families and children. The the family is under intense attack, and so that that's why Satan is going after, in my opinion, going after families. I think one thing that that uh, we see in the original family and the original plan was, uh, like Pastor James, you're saying, is to reveal the image of God. And what is it in the image of God? All of the the Godhead were selfless. Um, Jesus came to reveal the Father. The Holy Spirit came not to speak of himself, but to reveal the Son. Uh, God gave his only begotten Son. And it's all about selflessness. And, and I like to tell young people that the, the thing about marriage is that if it is self-serving, that it will not be satisfactory. It needs to be serving, uh, selfless. And um, we have scripture, you know, that the, the wife is to submit to the husband, the husband is to love the wife, but the idea that each is to um, to bring satisfaction and pleasure to the other. Uh, I tell young people that are asking what's wrong with masturbation, I said, well, with that, you develop a long habit of self-gratification. And then when you get yourself, you find yourself eventually in a marriage situation, you're going to be so used to sexual intimacy as a way of self-gratification that you're going to use your wife for that purpose and she will never be fulfilled. She will be a sex object. Um, God meant for, for us to, I mean, the principle is love God supremely, your neighbors, yourself, put others ahead of yourself. And in the marriage, we are to, to focus on the desires and needs of the other one. In the, I think in the gay culture, what we're looking at is um, self-gratification primarily. And it's, it does destroy the image of God in man. It ceases the, the um, beautiful gift of procreation by and large. I think this is one reason that it tends to uh, bring society to an end when, when the society ceases reproducing itself in large enough numbers to sustain itself. Um, but it, it is a self-focus, and that is the opposite of what God's intent for marriage was. It was to, you know, when, when God saw, after creating man, meaning mankind, remember he said it was very good. He was very, very pleased with what he had created. And he gave the wonderful gift of procreation to man that we also can, in partnership with God, create people in our image. Um, God is supposed to see his image. The world is supposed to see the image of God through marriage and families. And, and this whole thing of procreating is being so terribly um, devalued through abortion and through uh, homosexuality and all of that, that God's image is very definitely being destroyed in humanity. If we're busy, so busy with self-gratification, how do we find any real intimacy? Right. That's not intimacy. That's self-intimacy. <laughs> and intimacy is supposed to be between the two, two people. Yeah. And I think it affects also our ability to be intimate with God, I would think, because we don't understand true intimacy. To any young people that might be listening, I just want to say this, and older people, marriage is awesome. Yeah, it has its challenges, sure. And there'll be times when your marriage experience will challenge you in ways that maybe you wouldn't be, but it will also be one of the most rewarding things you could do. You see, when God puts two hearts together, he does something very, very special. 
In two people walking in oneness, their lives are saying something about the Godhead, as was mentioned earlier. And you will also be one in a thousand. People will come to you and say, how'd you do it? They want, they want that. They're hungry for it. So marriage is a very, very special thing. You hear the term lately that love is love. You ever heard that? That's not true. That's not true at all. There's different kinds of loves. Uh, what do you love? What matters and what determines whether that's true or not is what are you loving? For instance, if there's no difference between love, then there's no difference between those who love darkness, as the Bible talks about, because their deeds are evil, and those who love the Lord God with all their mind, soul, and body, right? Love is not love. The question is, what are you loving? If you're married, you at some point, and I didn't know this when I got married, uh, I got married thinking there was only one kind of intimacy, and I was pretty excited about that. And I soon realized, by God's grace, that there were three kinds. There's spiritual, emotional, and physical or sexual. And I, know, I mentioned them in the proper order, spiritual, emotional, and physical. You put them in the right order, and it's awesome. You're going to enjoy life. I mean, you'll have some trials. You'll have challenges, sure. But your life is going to say something about the Godhead, something unique. And in our world, people are looking for that kind of example. So give it, a, give it some thought. Go out there and ask God to bring you a good spouse. And don't just jump at the first one and say, oh, there's one. No, choose wisely and treat kindly and, and have fun. So what order did you put those in? Spiritual? Spiritual, emotional, and physical or sexual. And spiritual came first. Adam had spiritual intimacy with God before Eve was even around. Eve came along and he had another dimension all of a sudden, something very special. He had emotional intimacy where two hearts can become one. And then lastly, Adam knew his wife and sexually. And so they experienced physical intimacy. Our world, by the way, turns those three upside down, right? Have you noticed? Of course you have. Sexual, emotional, spiritual. Do it God's way. You'll be happy. Yeah, the spiritual parts if you get around to it. Yeah. Or you fall for false spirituality. Something I share with audiences is intimacy without Jesus. <laughs> Go ahead, Brian. Oh, I was going to say something I share with audiences, you know, when I speak is without Jesus, you, you can do whatever you want. But if we're looking at somebody who's wanting to get to know Christ, it's important that we recognize our own brokenness and what it is in our lives that needs healing. And so in that, we need to come to a position. I need to come to a position of humility. And when you come to a position of humility, you begin to see what the brokenness is. Um, a colleague in, in an ex-gay ministry has said to me before, homosexuality has been um, a tool that has been used to fix what is broken. And I believe, I believe that's true. A lot of people are going down that road thinking that this will fix whatever is broken in my life. Um, it could have been a traumatic experience or incest or um, a sexual abuse or something has gone wrong. And they think that if if they can find somebody that matches their idea of what they consider love to be, that will fix it. And it, it doesn't work well unless I'm looking at the, the author and the creator of love. I saw a fellow who was uh, British, and uh, he's had 18 surgeries because he says he identifies as a Korean. Uh, he's a Caucasian British person, but he's had these surgeries to, to gain the physical appearance of a Korean person. Um, somehow, I just wonder if that's going to really ever bring him the satisfaction that, that he says it does. That doesn't start with the spiritual. Mm -hmm. That's starting with the physical, just exactly as uh, you just said, Jerry, everything's turned upside down. And we think we're going to get somehow to some good place and yet we're starting out upside down. How are we going to ever get to that good place if, if, if our whole uh, approach is inverted to begin with? 
there's there's one other thought that I would like to add to this. Um, while I think it's it's perfectly valid for us to appeal to our legislature, our government, for all the issues that we talked about now that we want to preserve away. After all, the happiness of, of the subjects is important. And um, we certainly have a formula for it that I think is a valid one. And you can even you can even prove it in the things that we've been talking about right now. But I also think that the one thing that we ought to remind our leaders is that there's a pure secular approach as to why um, these kinds of acts are not good. Um, and that is this, is that if you look at uh, political science, it's been spoken about and well known for, for millennia, really, that um, when you try to field an army, which you have to have, this is one of the core uh, responsibilities of a government is to provide security. Um, when you do that, um, first of all, you have to have a demographic to do it. And if we look at what's going on around the world, as we have these, these, these kinds of things, LGBTQ uh, stuff exploding, we're seeing less and less population. And another problem is, is that they've also, political science will tell you that it's much easier to motivate people to fight for themselves if they have a, a, a family at home to do it. That's why we say things like, go fight for hearth and home. And I think it's important that we, we talk about these kinds of aspects with our political leaders so that we aren't viewed purely as trying to per, uh, force a religious view on some, someone. I think that our religious view um, actually goes very nicely with a pure political, um, pure political concerns. I think it's just something we ought to keep in mind. So maybe that's a good transition to kind of this, maybe more or less the last section of our talk. I wanted us to talk about, I want us to think together about what are the problems uh, and most of all, what kind of solutions uh, from the standpoint of the individual, the family, your church, um, the denomination, what, what are the problems? What are the, in a co most concrete way, what are the problems we have in these areas of sexuality and marriage? And, uh, and what, what can we do uh, what are solution solution things that we can look at? Because again, I I think it's I think this is rough stuff. Uh, but I, I think the church I wouldn't give the church necessarily an A or a B uh, about how well we've done. Uh, I think we're we're in a lot of trouble. Uh, and I'm not sure that I have the answer, but but I think we need to to look look for some kind of positive things and, and direction for what we need to do more of, or maybe what we need to do less of, but uh, we can't just, I think, sit on our hands and think that this is gonna go past us. This is affecting families and all of our churches. We all have relatives or people that are experimenting or confused or both. What are some of the, some of the particular problems uh, in these areas? What are some of the possible solutions from all of you, each of you? Could, could I just point out two things about this? Um, this Respect of Marriage Act, I think it's it's related, but I think we may have gone past it to a point, but I, I did want to, to bring it up. Um, two things is that this, this particular bill will repeal the Defense of Marriage Act, which was, yeah. um, was passed back in, uh, 90s, in the 90s, about 25 years ago, signed into law by Bill Clinton, and that law uh, was stating very clearly that marriage is between one man and one woman, and it, it was really a defense of marriage as, you know, biblical marriage as we know it, um, and it's amazing that in 25 years that can be totally repealed to now anything goes, and I remember when the, the, um, the Supreme Court made the ruling supporting gay marriage, to me, uh, and I've said this in many of my presentations, when we do not accept the creator of marriage, uh, uh, his definition of marriage, then there is no definition because, um, because if we try to redefine it, well, then anyone who has the authority to define marriage, except the one who created it in the first place, and now that's where we are now because anything goes. Um, polygamy, polyamory, 
uh, all of these different things. But one thing, you know, this Senator Mike Lee tried to get an amendment. He said he might would be able to vote for this bill uh, if, if he could make an amendment, and he offered an amendment that would strengthen religious liberty protections by preventing the government from removing tax-exempt status for religious organizations based on their convictions on marriage. But the sponsors of the bill adamantly refused even to consider that amendment. So, you know, our ministry is a 501c3 ministry. The denomination is a 501c3 ministry. Um, and this bill actually sets everyone up who's taking a stand on this to lose their tax exempt status. Of course, I've always taken the position that God has more money than the government, so don't worry about it. However, that that very thing, I think, influences to a major extent uh, the decisions uh, that that many religious organizations um, are making. Uh, but they absolutely refuse to even consider an amendment that would protect religious organizations from uh, having their tax exempt status uh, revoked on their stand. So I think that's very dangerous. And um, uh, can you move that? And it's something that we need to really be aware of. Larry, you sent me a, uh, uh, a webinar, uh, the link to a webinar, and I, I watched it. And uh, that one of the presenters uh, made an a, a interesting comment, actually was quoting uh, someone else. Um, and it was kind of a, a funny statement, but it was very telling, I thought. Uh, if we don't have a seat at the table, we're probably on the menu. And uh, that, that idea, I think, is, is very prevalent. And I think that idea goes all the way back to World War II, uh, you know, and the lead up to World War II in Germany, because uh, there was a very strong support of, uh, of Adolf Hitler. And the church was faced in a very difficult situation, and and they had to make choices, you know, and and so on. And as we look at the choices that they made, um, you know, and in in much of the church went in support of uh, Hitler. And so you know, you kind of have this this two uh, two part approach, uh, where one approach is well, you know, we see this tsunami coming, so let's try to you know, do whatever we can to try to hold out as long as we can uh, and, and make, you know, make, make adjustments or concessions if necessary, but, you know, let's, let's, let's hold it. And the other, which uh, I believe was uh, the belief of Daniel, Daniel, you know, he, he, um, when he heard the decree that was made, and by the way, this wasn't something that was coming through the legislature, the king made the decree, and it was instantaneously, it was law. There was no, no due process to go through to get it to the law. But when he heard, when he heard that, uh, that um, anyone who dissented from worshiping the king for 30 days would be thrown into the lions, he immediately went and opened his window and he knelt in a place where everyone, and I mean everyone, could see, knowing that instantaneously he would, uh, he would be uh, on the menu. And... Um, and he, yeah, he, he got on the menu, but he didn't get eaten. So he, he wasn't, he wasn't lunch. And, and I think, I think we should look at that story again, kind of as a paradigm that says, you know, are we trying to, you know, go into our, I, I mean, there, there was nothing specifically morally wrong going into the closet uh, and praying in this closet. And I'm sure a lot of people did that, but Daniel says, I'm not adjusting that one iota what I do because my relationship with God comes first. And that's, uh, yes, he was on the menu, but no, he didn't become supper. Good point, James. There are two problems as I see it, and we've discussed one already. Number one, the culture has built an idol to homosexuality, and they are trying to force us to worship that idol or face tremendous financial, legal, or cultural marginalization. That's one problem. The second problem, as I see it, is progressives in the church, they look at this tsunami, LGBTQ agenda, and they rightly conclude that it's 
It's an unstoppable force, at least it looks that way. They wrongly conclude that the best approach is to say we want a place at the table. That should sound familiar. A hundred years ago, our fathers had to confront evolution when it was coming into society and into schools. And we've had a hundred years go by since then. I would suggest humbly that our response should be better than theirs because some of them capitulated, uh, some of them strove valiantly against it, but ultimately it made its way into the modern world. Our response should be better. Progressives in the church concluded we want a place at the table. Well, how do you get a place at the table? You have to compromise. This uh, disrespect for marriage, as I call it, act, has a window dressing compromise amendment that basically says that there are already existing religious liberty and conscience protections in the Constitution. And federal law should actually help you. Well, that doesn't work that way because simply stating that there are protections that already exist does not and will not stop the radical left from dragging good people into the court system and publicly tarring and feathering them simply for living in fidelity to God. We have to do better than this. I, as well-intended as our religious liberty people, who most of them are caught up in social justice issues anymore, I hate to have to say that, but most of them are, and I believe it's true. As well-meaning as they may have been, I don't think that their counsel on this issue has been a good one. I think at the end of the day, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a test to all of us <clears throat> to go back and to, to come at oneness with our creator, our savior, um, and to develop intimacy with God. And that's, you know, that's, that's my daily um, predicament in life. And, and it's when I invite others to join um, because the world's going to do all kinds of things in the government is going to go rampant with with the way of the world and whatever the narratives are and it's it's going to be my relationship with Christ and how strong that is that is going to see me through just like the Daniel um, circumstance um, I know it sounds very simple but it my challenge each and every day is to develop that intimacy with Christ that will secure me and potentially secure others to be a drawing agent to Jesus Christ because I can't share what I don't have. And I spent way too long <clears throat> in the LGBT culture, um, which has taxed me and left scars on me, you know, 40 years. And I wasn't just, you know, somebody I was one that they would accuse today that needed something more, that needed Jesus. You know, I, I lived a very promiscuous life, and and I it was all about self gratification. And so today, it's about learning to live, uh, recognizing that Jesus is all that I need. He is all the gratification that I need. So maybe the last thought um, is, so I don't want to take away because I think we come to a pretty good spot here. But one more thing. Um, narratives how can we help all of our people i'm thinking of the younger people too though how can we help people tune into a, the the biblical narrative and actually look at those sources and look for insight in those sources when uh you know so much so much of what's happening is you know the this is kind of the 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 narrative um source you know whatever whatever comes across your phone so many of our people are are deeply entrenched in whatever whatever's going on on the phone uh and i've got a bible on my phone too but um how can we how can we as a church make sure that the biblical the true biblical narrative is what we're rooting our humanity and rooting our concepts of intimacy and spirituality and what steps can we do to help with that? Or are we just going to uh, have the young people in the back row uh, looking at their phones during the worship service? I mean, 
Any, any thoughts on that? One thing we could do would happen at the educational level in our church. If I was on the accreditation or educational board in the church, and I, I never will be, and I'm okay with that, but I would recommend strongly that our academies, our universities would devote maybe once a quarter to something about biblical sexuality. You could invite the entire student body to sit in on a video or two. A couple of months ago, we had a endearing video on Fulcrum 7 of a young girl who had been caught up in the transgender movement. And praise God, she got free from it. And you can see this transition. You can see the healing and the joy come back into her face and her eyes. A story like that needs to be told because it's a story of victory. It's a testimony. And the Bible says in the end of time, testimonies are going to have a tremendous impact, including yours and mine. That's one thing we could do. We need to address this issue of biblical sexuality. I'm afraid we're doing a pretty poor job of it. And I don't want to appear negative. Maybe in some circles, people are doing well, but we need to do better. And it should start in our universities and our academies. Teach these people the beauty and the distinction of biblical sexuality. This video should be shown in every one of our colleges. We're told in Revelation 12, 11, that we overcome by the, the accuser, by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimonies. And I know Wayne, uh, Wayne and I both have the same experience. We both come out of the gay culture ourselves. For me, it was 31 years ago. But I, I really feel that my most powerful presentation uh, to young people is when I share my own personal testimony. I was able to do that at Southern uh, several years ago. And um, I was warned, you know, not to be... Um, uh, not to take it personally, if the students are sitting there studying during the worship, the chapel worship time or looking at their clocks or whatever. And I was surprised that they would even allow that during worship. But it turned out to be the largest turnout for this joint chapel to the, of, of the year at that point. And those students were so reactive. They were praising the Lord. They were applauding. They were straining their necks. Um, they, it was the faculty that were so leery about my being there. The students really, really reacted. And to me, that's an affirmation about the power of the personal testimony. It does get the attention of the young people. And I think, you know, in, in the Gospel Commission, uh, Matthew 28, you know, Jesus said, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you until the end of the world. And what, what we have come to in this generation is the LGBT community is a global culture. It, is, it, it needs the gospel just like any nation, any kindred, any tongue, and any people. <clears throat> and if we hold back from preaching about these issues and teaching on these issues, we are not fulfilling the gospel commission. And that's why when I read, you know, cry aloud and spare not, <laughs> um, that you can do that with compassion. You can do that with love and, um, and really win people's attention. But we are not to shy away from these issues. Uh, when the laws of man conflict with the laws of God, and when the laws of man conflict with the gospel commission, uh, I think we should err on the side of the gospel commission. That's kind of where I stand on that. Yeah. I know when, when California, when they passed the law, uh, Jerry Brown signed in the law on January 1 a few years ago, that um, a, a law against counseling teenagers, anyone under 18, you could not counsel them on these issues or you'd lose your license. And I thought, well, if they can find mine, they can have it. But you don't need a license to share the gospel commission. And, and I thought, isn't that just like Satan to try to outlaw? And the highest rate of correction, we're told, is in the ages of 
16 and 17 in this whole issue. And so Satan tries to outlaw the ability to even talk to these young people. Now, you can counsel them to embrace their homosexuality, to learn to just love themselves and get on with it, but to counsel them that there is a way out is against the law, and not just in California. In Washington, D.C., and in New Jersey, and about 10 other states, they're passing these laws. But I just keep thinking, no, the Gospel Commission trumps that. We cannot... We have to realize we're not dealing with uh, just social issues and legal issues. We're dealing with sin. We're dealing with uh, the message of salvation from sin. And we dare not hold back in dealing with this issue in within our church and outside the church. And we, again, I say we can do that with great compassion, but we should never compromise. You know, I have to say, I, I really appreciate, you know, Wayne Blakely's ministry and, and also coming out ministries. And uh, Michael Carducci, I know he's not here, but uh, I think he's he's right on in the idea of trying to reach, you know, those small children. I think that's where the effectiveness really is, is we've got to go after those first and second graders, because those are the ones that are first going to have their first encounters with pornography. We've got to get to the Listen, the world is going after these uh, first and second graders uh, through the book, uh, their books and, and videos and stuff. And so we've got to start seeding their minds with truth so that when they encounter uh, the error, that they immediately identify it and reject it. Amen. Well, let's we can do that on their age level, you know, age appropriate messages, Absolutely. starting in the home and then in, in school. You can talk about these issues very easily with young people uh, at their level. I would just like to add one more thought that I think uh, about what to do. And that is, I think it's important for us not to look at the legislature that we're seeing right now as the problem. Uh, we live in a, in a democracy, and I really firmly believe that the problem is in our society as a whole, and what we're seeing with this legislation is much more of a symptom. And so with that in mind, I think that the real goal that we all need to stop and look at ourselves at is how are we engaging with our neighbors? And we need to view this as something that we need to be engaging with the neighbors um, and, and preaching the gospel to them. I think that if anything, this should help us to believe and, and recognize that our mission field is right here and it's all over the place and it's all around us. And if we can do that, if we can engage in this mission field, I think that's that's really how we um, we do the gospel commission. And I think that fundamentally is, is how you possibly reform. But we also know from Bible prophecy that reform is not likely. We know where this all leads. So I think right now is our time to engage in our neighbors to save as many people as we possibly can for the kingdom while we watch essentially the ship go down. So on that note, I'm not sure if that's the most positive note, but I'm sorry. It's realistic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me, let me just run through real quick. I want to make sure that the people who are viewing the video have opportunity to connect further with each of you. Uh, Jonathan, why don't I just start with you? Just the, the, the quick version. If you have a website or a podcast or a place where people can find you or something you want to recommend, what, what link would we put on the screen? Yeah, it'd be great. Um, I'm the vice president for religious liberty for liberty and health uh, for the Liberty and Health Alliance. And our webpage is libertyandhealth.org. And you can see uh, what we're up to. And we post videos and discussions of uh, uh, I put out videos with a couple other attorneys and other people with our group on on things like we just did one on Dobbs not too long ago and we're probably going to do one on this subject as well. Hey Ron Wolsey. Uh, yes I'm <clears throat> I'm a pastor of 31 years um, though I did get retired about three years ago <laughs> um, but also a uh, I've pastored a, a two church district here in Arkansas for years. Uh, we actually started the first church 30 years ago and uh, it's still going strong. Uh, but I'm also one of the co-founders of Coming Out Ministries, senior speaker. And, um, and uh, you know, at our ministry, we travel internationally. We travel all over the country uh, with, you know, churches, weeks of prayer, 
uh, seminars, ministers, workers, meetings, camp meetings, uh, wherever we get an invitation, we go to share whatever we can share. My personal contact information would be ron at comingoutministries.org. All righty. Very good. Uh, Wayne. Uh, I'm the director of Know His Love Ministries, and my website is Know His Love, K N O W, like Get to Know Christ, Know His Love Ministries.org. <clears throat> I also have a YouTube channel, uh, Know His Love. And again, this is about developing intimacy with Jesus Christ and do weekend seminars or uh, retreats wherever I'm called that um, are interested in having this discussion. And it definitely is a discussion. It's not just one-sided. And the, you know, even in, <clears throat> I'm also a retired uh, co-founder of Coming Out Ministries. And I think Ron would agree that probably one of the, the most anticipated and enjoyed portion of our presentations is the Q&A because people are walking around with a lot of questions and they want answers. And I always say, I don't have all the answers, but I will point you to the one who does. Very good. Uh, Mr. Wagoner. Uh, I'd like to refer to myself as a country boy from Ohio or a country guy. I own a commercial industrial roofing corporation, and we also spray polyurethane foam insulation uh, on a large scale. But what do we do for ministry? I'm one of the editors at an online publication called Fulcrum 7 that has risen from almost nothing in 2016, January 1, to now having between four and 500,000 unique visitors per year. And we're on track to break the record again this year. I'm excited, really, about the Adventist message. I'm excited about what the Lord is doing in my life and my wife and I, and I'm excited about what God can do in your life. Pastor James Ash, tell us a little bit about, about your, your thing. I'm the pastor at the Stateline Adventist Church that's in the Walla Walla Valley, so you can uh, come by and uh, come check us out on a Sabbath morning. Just make sure and come early because the seats are a little bit short in supply, but uh, we're working on that. Um, you can contact me uh, through our website. That's uh, statelinesda.org. And um, there should be a place to uh, send a, uh, I think it's info at statelinesda.org. All right, very good. And I have uh, my YouTube channel, Larry the Guy from Michigan. And I have um, a uh, podcast, audio podcast at subscribestar.com slash, I think, Larry, the guy from Michigan, we talk about the onset of totalitarianism and how we can be Christians in that um, in that framework anyways. So anyway, thank you each one for participating. Brother Wayne, I wonder if you would have a just a, just a word of prayer here at the end. Sure. Thank you, Lord, that we still <clears throat> have freedoms to be able to come together and um, have these discussions. And I pray that, Lord, each and every one would want to continue to promote our our freedoms that we have in America, including that of religious freedom. Most of all, Lord, I pray that each and every one will look inside and see um, where they are with our relationship to Jesus Christ and how you are trustworthy, Lord, uh, from beginning to end, and that uh, each one would develop that relationship with you that gives them a new identity in Christ. We thank you, Lord. Ask that you'll be with each one who views this. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, each one, for participating. And uh, may God be with each one.